This morning we're going to, we were talking uh, in our Bible class this morning about uh, the lordship and the kingship of Christ, and we got to the point of the Gospel of John where uh, the crucifixion of Jesus is the ultimate rejection of God's authority and Jesus' authority and rule. And the book of Jude is, uh, if I could just pick a theme, he talks about several things, but I think they all have come together into this one major theme of rejecting God's authority. And you know, every, uh, a lot of sermons have three points. This is a sermon of three points, and, and some of you may have heard me uh, give a similar lesson some time back, uh, but I think this is a really good reminder because it really fits into a lot of things we've been studying recently. Um, and so here's going to be the outline. We're going to, this is going to be a textual lesson. We're going to be looking through the text, look at the introduction, uh, this idea of contending for our faith, the faith, the same one that was delivered to the saints. And in light of this, uh, against people who would teach falsely or have us believe falsely, and we need to be reminded of how God has dealt with people in the past. Those who reject God's authority, uh, that God's judgment is rendered upon them. And we're also going to be learning a little bit about how Jude encourages us to contend for that faith, and then a closing uh, prayer and thanksgiving to God. So as we look at this introduction here in the first two verses, we see, and if you allow me to read it, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. He says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, a brother uh, and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Now, of all the things that Jude could have addressed himself as, perhaps brother of Jesus, I mean, we learn uh, not just, we, we learn in Jude 1 that he's calling himself a bondservant of Christ and brother of James, but in gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and John, I have references up here, uh, Jesus had a brother named Jude, or Judas as it's called uh, in the original language, and history tells us, and the tradition is, that it's the same Jude that wrote this book. It seems odd that he was not addressed himself as the brother of Jesus. He first and foremost considered himself a slave or in subjection to Christ, putting himself in subjection to God because all things are put into subjection to Christ. First and foremost, his identity was wrapped up in the fact that he is a servant of Christ, in subjection. And I think that's important because that's the very first thing that he says, James, a slave. James, a servant. So in light of everything he's going to be warning the Christians about, and, and by application us here, that is who, I, who I, he identifies himself as being. <clears throat> and he's written to people and addresses them in three, by three different things. And this is our first three points. He says he's written to people who are called. And we talked about that in the book of 1 Corinthians before, that they are, they're called out of the world to be a, a special people, to be holy by God. They are loved by God, God's special people. And they are kept, or in this idea, protected. You think of a safe where you lock up something. It's kept by Jesus Christ. Now, this, so this is known as a general epistle because it's not written to the church in Rome or the church in Corinth or church in Thessalonica or, or one of the other churches. It's just written to those who are called. It's written to Christians. And so we call it sometimes a general epistle. Now, notice this benediction. A benediction means a well wish. It means w wishing someone well. What he's wishing is for three things. Here's another second three points. For them to have mercy, and that's mercy from God. For them to have peace, and we're going to talk about what this peace may be as we go through here. Uh, it's peace not only among brethren, but ultimately peace with God and love. Love towards each other and love towards God and from God, as we see there in verse 2. So let's look into verses 3 through 4. It says, Beloved, again addressing them as not just loved by God, but he loves them as well. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation ungodly person who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So a couple things in here is, first of all, uh, we're in a society where it's kind of not politically correct to contend or argue or dispute, you know, and, and there's certain things people say you're not supposed to talk about at a dinner party, right? 
religion, politics, and you know stuff like that, right? Maybe maybe your favorite sports team. If you live here, it's like don't argue about the Yankees and the Red Sox, right? So th these are kind of things that there's certain things you're not supposed to contend about. But here Jude is talking about Christians contending uh, over something. Now the word contend means something like grappling or wrestling, being being really uh, involved and in, in straining at something, to be really concerned about this thing. And so while he wanted to just write them a nice letter about their common salvation, encouraging words, in light of something, in light of his just concern about Christians at large, and we studied this recently in our, our study about prayer, about how Paul was concerned about the, the brethren in Thessalonica, and he was worried about what might happen to them in the face of their persecution. So while he wanted to write them this letter, he felt really compelled to write the following things. And that is to contend earnestly for the, what he calls the faith. And this, this is a, something that I think is a, uh, uh, all, it encompasses all of the body of teachings, and I'm not going to go into all these other references here, but you can look them up if you like as you're listening to me, but the faith is something that is the body of teaching, the doctrine and the teaching of the church. The, it was the teachings of Christ, and by extension, the, the authority he gave to the apostles to teach, and they were authorized and inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach God's will, uh, what Jesus wanted for the church. They're supposed to contend earnestly for that. And so it is a, it is a, a salvation and a, and a faith that was handed down. It's not continually developing as we go forward. It's not to be interpreted uh, uniquely in each generation and what it means to them. It was something, he says, it was handed down once to the saints, meaning even at this time, this is an old book, it was already established. And so he wants to them to contend, find out what it is, make sure that they have the same faith that was handed down and established in the original church, and then contend for that. Don't go reinventing it. And uh, I think this is a tangible thing that was delivered. It's what we accept as the scriptures. And so for us to know it today, we would be reading uh, the scriptures as outlined, as outlined here. So that's verses 3 through 4. Um, <clears throat> now, who has this faith been entrusted to? Well, it's an epistle. It's, it's entrusted to believers. Now, sometimes we, we, um, we relegate our authority to other people. If, like I say, if I don't want to do my, dry, my laundry, you know, I may relegate that to the dry cleaner or something like that. Well, sometimes we relegate or delegate uh, defending the faith to a preacher or to the scholars or to the people who write books. But here he's saying that it's entrusted to you, the believers, and you're the one that's supposed to uh, defend it, contend for it. And I want to impress that upon us uh, here today. Now, but why does it need to be defended? Uh, doesn't it just appear and, and speak for itself? Well, he goes on to say that the reason it needs to be defended is that some people have a tendency of creeping in without being noticed. Now, that is hard to do. You know, if, if somebody just came in and they looked like a real goblin or a booger or somebody that was just obviously sinful, then they wouldn't be able to creep in unnoticed, would they? Everybody would notice that and it wouldn't be a, a problem. But some people, they creep in unnoticed, he's saying in verse 4. People creep in without going noticed. Now, he, he assures that these people have long beforehand been marked out, and so they're not fooling God. Uh, but what they, what they do is that they're turning the grace of God, and what that means is it's God has bestowed unmerited favor upon them, and what do they do with it? Do they do, do, they do what they're supposed to do with it, and in response to that, uh, love towards God and become holy and in and, and service and become a slave to God because of this undeserved favor? No, what they do with it is they turn it into a license for sin. They turn it into ungodliness and licentiousness. He says, uh, into verse 4, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our, our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So what, our, what God's grace towards us should do it should make, because we feel unworthy and sinful, it should make us feel really bad, unworthy, and in response to that, we love God, and we want to serve God, and He's our Master. But what it does, but when people turn that, that um, into a license for sin and unrestraint, that's what licentiousness means, just, just unrestraint, what they're doing is they're denying the Lord. And so, how did these people get in the church? Well, they, got, they creeped in unnoticed. Uh, like I said before. Well, let's look at uh, this next section where he's going to go on to remind them 
of God's judgments. Because he says, you know, people like this, and this is a warning for us too, is we should not turn our salvation into a license for sin. He says, you need to remember that God's dealt with these kind of people before, and it's always turned out bad for them. So let me, let me read verses 5 through 16. He says, Now I desire to remind you, though, though you know all things once and for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe, and angels who do not keep their own domain, but abandon their proper abode, he's kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality, went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal life. Yet in the same way these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, he did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, for they, pay, for they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men, these are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts, when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, Clouds without water, carried along by the winds. Autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars for whom the, blackness, the black darkness has been reserved. Uh, let me keep going to verse 16. It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. So there's a lot of um, condemning language there. But there's also, in the midst of that, a lot of references to Old Testament stories and examples that, on the surface, we might not understand if we're not too familiar with the Old Testament book. So I'd like to kind of take some time and explain, step-by-step, uh, step, his argumentation through this text. So when, when he started out here reminding them about God's judgments in verse 5, again, three points, he's going to give three examples of God's judgments from the Old Testament. The first one is the people of Israel. The people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt to the Egyptians, and God wanted to make himself his own very special people. So he made the nation of Israel and brought them out of wilderness by the ten plagues you're familiar with, gave them the promised land, and in between Egypt and the promised land was a big desert, a wilderness. And because they disobeyed God in that wilderness, a lot of them died. Actually, most of them died. You know, all the ones 20 years old were spared. So his point is, that God saved these Israelites out of Egypt, but he destroyed those who were not faithful later. And that's a warning for Christians. Those who become Christians and have this promise of a promised land, of salvation, but yet are no longer remain faithful to God, he wants us to look at the example of the Israelites brought out of, uh, out of Egypt and remember that God can strike us down if we don't remain faithful. So I think the lesson here that he's trying to apply is that salvation requires this continued faithfulness, a transformation. The next one is rebellious angels. And this one is a little confusing here. But he tells us that some angels basically overstep their own position, their own domain. Now, an angel is a messenger. And really, in fact, from the text, literally, without any context, you don't know from the word whether it is a person, whether it's a, I'm sorry, whether it's a supernatural thing or just somebody sent on an errand. So technically, it's just an errand boy or an errand person. But in the context of the, the biblical accounts, when God sends an errand or message person, a lot of times it was a supernatural kind of uh, being. But in, when you think about a messenger, they're just supposed to do the work that the, the person sending them is to do. If you send a messenger, they just, they're supposed to know their place and just carry out the message. But he's warning us here about examples about where angels overstep their position 
and God punished those messengers. And that's the lesson here. God punishes those who don't respect his authority, who don't hold to their position and, uh, and recognize their position. And, and so why is he telling this? Again, Christians need to be you know, continually warned that God is in control and he will rule. And if we don't, if we don't accept his rule, if we reject it, then there's judgment to come. The third one is an example you're probably familiar with, and that's Sodom and Gomorrah. This, these two towns do not have a good reputation, I don't think, in anybody's eyes. And even if you don't know that much about the Bible, you've probably heard of Sodom, because that always has a bad connotation. Sodom and Gomorrah were two uh, cities that were destroyed by fire from heaven because they were wicked and immoral. And it says here in this text, they indulged in gross immorality. Immorality is not specific here, but it's sexual sin of some sort. We know that in the story of Lot, that the, that the men of the city wanted to come and have relations with the two men that were sent as messengers. Went after strange or flesh, it says here. And the consequence was, is it says they were burned with eternal fire. Now, I think the, the choice of words here doesn't mean that Sodom and Gomorrah is still burning, but it's a final and condemning judgment, a lasting judgment. And the lesson for us is, is that immoral people will be completely destroyed, eternally, a final judgment. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, can we escape God's judgment by rejecting his authority and committing sin? And the answer is no, we can't. We can't think that. We'd be fooling ourselves. So he goes on in verse 8, um, he says, in the same way, is, in the same way, meaning uh, based on the three examples I showed you, in the same way these dreamers, or meaning we'd say, if somebody tells us something that's absolutely foolish, we'd say, you're dreaming, man. You, you, you've deluded yourself. So in the same way, these dreamers, again, they do three things, three points. Number one is they defile the flesh. By sinning and corrupting and, and allowing sin in their life, they're continually to corrupt their own bodies and their own their spirit and their own mind. The second thing they do is they reject lordship, it says here in the text. Now, we would say in our, in our modern way of speaking, they have a problem with authority. They're, they're wallowing in sin, defiling themselves. They're rejecting authority. And the third one's a little bit hard to understand. It says they're blaspheming or rejecting majesties. But I think this ties into, blasphemy means to speak against something. What it is is they're overstepping their authority once again. They're talking bad about the things that have been set in place that God says are good and glorious and, and authority, and they're rejecting those things, speaking against them. And so one of the examples here to, to illustrate the point that Michael, and if you're familiar with the, the, the Bible, all Michael was the chief angel. It says here he's the archangel, which means he was the greatest angel. You think, well, as an angel, he would have a lot of authority. But Jude is pointing out that even Michael, who was the chief angel, did not overstep his bounds. And when he was confronting the devil, <clears throat> even though he was the archangel and, and perhaps the, the leader of the charge in spiritual warfare, he left it up to God and did not step, overstep his authority in condemning the devil. He said, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael knows how to keep his place, and by, by illustration, we should as well. So in Jude, uh, verse 10, it says that these blaspheme the spiritual, uh, and, and, and that's what I'm going to, I'm just um, summarizing this. They're blaspheming spiritual things while they're being defiled by natural things, if you look at verse 10. And so I just kind of paraphrase this, that, you know, if you act like animals, you're going to be judged and condemned like an animal. If you continue to reject lordship and, and follow after your flesh and follow after your lust, you're going to have to suffer the consequences of God's judgment in doing that. And so in verse 11, he says, woe to them. You know, that is a condemning thing, just woe to them. And the reason is, he's going to give a couple examples, three more examples here. Again, three points. The first one is Cain. They've gone after the way of Cain. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, we have to understand what Cain is. Cain, you probably know Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother Abel in the book of Genesis. Now, if you remember the confrontation or the, the discussion that God had with Cain, he said that sin is crouching at the door when he wanted to kill his brother. He was jealous about his brother's sacrifice. God said, sin is crouching at the door, and it, its desire is for you. I mean, it's out to get you. But he says, you must master it. Do you remember that? He must master it. He told Cain to do that. But Cain was, not, uh, was unwilling to take control and responsibility and 
and master his sin. And what he does instead, he chooses to follow after the desire that he has and the hatred, and he kills his brother. And as a result, he's banished. He's banished to walk the earth. And so the lesson, I think, is, is that these ungodly people have not mastered their sin. They have gone after the way of Cain, gone after fulfilling the desires of their flesh and do what they want. The second example is they've gone after the error of Balaam. Now, as the Is- Israelites are on their way to the, land, to the promised land of Canaan, you remember they come into some confrontation, and Balaam is uh, elicited as a, a helper by Balak to prophesy against the Israelites. And so in the beginning, Balaam starts off good. He says, you know, I can't say anything unless the Lord says it, right? But what happens is he keeps going back and going back. And the New Testament tells us here that he, what he did was he got greedy for money, didn't he? Ultimately, what he did is he, uh, but he allowed his own desires for, for monetary gain to influence him. And uh, I think that is what what ultimately tripped up uh, Balaam. God gave Balaam the truth, but really other things came in and helped him and, and caused him to stray for God. So I think the lesson here is that these ungodly persons, they're willing to exchange God's truth for a lie. So I want you to think about this for a second in terms of our own sin. We have a choice to make when sin confronts us, whether or not we are going to confront it master it, get control of it, and not let it dominate us. We're going to choose right over wrong. We also have a choice whether or not when, when, when we're enticed to leave God's truth, to believe a deceit or to believe a lie, whether or not we're going to exchange God's truth for a lie. Uh, in this case, they both know the truth. One was following after, and, and actually they're both following after the desires in, in different ways. So we need to think about that. The third one is, the third lesson, is the rebellion of Korah. Now, Korah was from the tribe, uh, they were from the Levites, and you remember the Levites had a very special place, they were the ones that were supposed to be priests, right? And, and Korah was honored with a very special tabernacle service. They had it made, man. They didn't have to do hard labor. All they had to do was carry around some of the instruments for the tabernacle every time God, you know, decided to move the cloud, and, and they were supposed to pick up and follow God through the wilderness, but yet, like many times, they just get discontent with their station. They thought that they needed to deserve more, and they started, uh, they started rebelling against the authority that God had given Moses. And so what they did is they started questioning Moses in, in number 16 and saying, Moses, why do you get to be the big shot? Why do you get to call and to tell us what to do? Now, God had treated them really good. He had set them apart and made them good. But what they did is that they were not happy. And as a result of their discontent, God, you remember what happened to him? The ground opened up and swallowed him up, and then it closed up, and it was an example. And so I think the lesson here is that God judges those, again, who reject divine authority. Now, the lesson for Christians is this. We were sinful. God gave, hey man, God gave us a great deal. He's willing to make us a child of his and clean us up from sin and put us on a straight path and, and give us blessings, and he's given us our jobs, and if you're married, he's given us you know, your wife, your family, all these wonderful blessings, our house to live in, food to eat. But yet, what happens? Sometimes we become discontent. We start looking around thinking, why does, why does God get to tell me what to do? Why does, you know, what's going on here? And so we reject that authority, and as a result of rejecting God's authority, judgment will come upon us. So again, all these people, and this is the theme of remember God's judgments, Cain is banished from God's presence. Balaam is killed by a sword later when they come into the land. Remember that? They take him over and he's killed. They find him. And Korah and his rebels, they're taken down to Sheol instantly. So they all, what's interesting is that they all brought down other people with them. Uh, They thought that their sin was in isolation. But in the the sense of Cain, he he was banished. And all of his family as a result, I mean, you saw how, when you read through Genesis, these people who are offspring of Cain, and it just kind of goes downhill. And Balaam, he's killed by the sword, but as a result, a lot of other people are killed around him. Uh, And Korah, remember, his whole family is taken down to Sheol with him, and other people around him who side with him. So they all brought down people with him as a result of their sin. Now, in Jude chapter 1 and verse 12, he says, These are stains in your love feast. Another translation may say these are hidden reefs. 
in any case it's bad, and I'm not sure which exactly is the accurate reading here. A hidden reef is something that's really dangerous, but it's under the water and you can't see it. A stain is something that's an obvious blemish. That is this, but neither way, they're not good. But there's three characteristics of these people. He says they're without fear, meaning they shamelessly feed themselves. He kind of goes on to say that they shamelessly feed themselves, and what they should be doing is caring about feeding others. We learned about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Remember the attitude of not taking the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner about how everyone was taking their own supper first and they were showing partiality towards others. They were not showing concern and respect and reverence towards others. These people are just thinking about themselves. The second thing is they're clouds without water. Now a cloud, in an agricultural analogy, when, you're, when you got seeds in the ground and you see a cloud coming, it's exciting because it's supposed to bring rain. It promises rain, but it doesn't deliver the rain. That's disappointing. So these are clouds, but they, they have the promise of rain, but they're not delivering. They don't deliver. Big promises, big show, looks great, but no substance to it. And the third thing is, and, and notice I'm marking these things out because they're without three things. They're without fear, they're without water, and they're without fruit. And the, thir the third one is that they're trees without fruit. Now the autumn time... And that season, they should have bearing, it's fruit season. It was the time that they should be bearing fruit. And a lot of Christians who have been Christians for a while, it should be season for them to be bearing fruit. But he says, you know, these people are trees in the autumn, in the season, but they have no fruit. And he says that they're twice dead. And I think the reason they're twice dead is because they have no fruit and they have no root. It says they've been uprooted. There's no root going down, which that represents faith. So there's no fruit coming up, you see, and that's twice dead, not rooted in their faith. And then he goes on in verse 13. These are, well, a couple other descriptions, they're wild. They're not constrained. They're like wild ocean waves. And what do wild ocean waves tend to wash up on the beach after a big storm? Garbage. You know, if you ever go down to the sound here, wild waves tend to just foam up and just continually, and, and, and it never stops, just one after another, after another, after another, just all these shameful deeds just keep coming to the surface. And wandering stars, we would call that a comet, something that burns really brightly and looks great, but yet it's not like a star fastened in the sky. And so what it does, it burns up bright and it crashes. And he goes on to say that it is destined, it's reserved for dark blackness forever. Because it did not stay where it was supposed to, it just burned up and, and went out into darkness. I think that's a, an image there of, of eventually God's judgment as well. So let's look at verse 14 and 15. He says, it was about these people or these men that God's judgment was decreed to go, and he, he references Enoch, against all ungodly, and these are people who were without fear or reverence, meaning that they're, um, they're impious, they, they don't have respect for God and his, and his desires. And what they're doing is they, they speak harsh things, against God. They're, they're blaspheming against God. They, they are resentful towards God. Verse 16 goes on to say that uh, they're grumblers and, and finding fault. Uh, so there's three things mentioned in verse 16 I want you to pay a close attention to. Uh, the first thing is you can notice someone like this because they're discontented grumblers. It means they're always complaining about something or complaining against God or complaining against others. The second thing is they're following their own desires instead of following what God wants. And the, second, and the third thing he mentions here is, in verse 16, is that they boast, they're prideful, and they're willing to flatter other people in order to gain advantage over them. In order to, because they're self-seeking and, and wanting to try to manipulate, they're going to flatter to gain an advantage. So does this sound like a worthy slave? I mean, this picture has been pretty condemning. We haven't really talked about any nice, lovely, wonderful things of God here, you know, and I'm sorry about that. And, and, and Jude, I'm sure, was sorry about that, too, because he said in the beginning, while I wanted to talk to you about our common salvation, I really felt compelled that I had to warn you about all this. And so that's what he's doing here. He's given this laundry list of characteristics so that you, they can remember what they read about in the Old Testament, identify it in the present, and be warned about it going forward into the future. So does this sound like a worthy slave? No, it's, it's not somebody who's subjected themselves to the authority of God and Christ. So how do we deal with it? What do we do now? 
So let's read verses 17 uh, through 22. Luckily, he doesn't leave us hanging. He doesn't leave us in despair in this letter. <clears throat> he says, But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, In the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, worldly devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy, I'm oh, sorry, let me, let me, yeah, and, and have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. And so I, I should have actually, I should have actually went through verse 23 there, and, I, and that's what I just read. So he gives us some encouraging instructions because he's really kind of bummed us out with all this negative talk. So he's, he's saying, you know, how do you go forward? Well, he reminds them that they're loved. He says, but you, beloved, I want you to do a couple of things. I want you to remember the words that the apostles taught you. Remember the words from the Lord's apostles, going back to that faith that was once delivered from the saints he mentioned earlier. He's saying, you know, I've told you ahead of time, so don't be surprised that there will be some people who make a mockery of the faith. And that's, you know, just like we were talking about how they were mocking Jesus. A mo somebody who's a mocker is somebody who actually, they don't necessarily have to be like what we would think of mocking. It's somebody who maybe pretends to be a Christian, but it's not. They're making a mockery of it. And, and the reason they're doing that is because they're following after their own ungodly lust. Now, he, he gives three characteristics to these people, they, or three, I guess, symptoms. One is that there's a tendency to cause division, a sow seeds of discord, which we have to be aware of. The other one, which we kind of mentioned before, is just this worldly mindedness. And the third one is, and probably the most significant, is they're devoid of the Spirit. They're without the Spirit of God. There's no fruit of the Spirit there. They're not thinking in the Spirit. They're not thinking spiritually. They're not trying to work towards unity in the faith and unity in the truth. They're really, everywhere they go, is causing division uh, among, among brethren and among the church. But he says, but you, beloved, and he wants Christians to do three things. The first one is, you need to build up your faith. And I, I, a couple things to point out here, he says, there's an emphasis in the original text of building yourself up on your most holy faith, which means you need to take ownership of this thing. It really doesn't come out probably as good in English, but you need to take ownership of this thing that's yours, that's been entrusted to you, as once delivered, so you need to be building yourself up and be edified in it. Don't wallow in despair. I know it was discouraging the things that he said, but we need to be building ourselves up in our faith, taking ownership of it. The second one is praying with the Holy Spirit, and this is what this does. It keeps us in God's love. I'm not sure what he means by with the Holy Spirit there. I'll admit that. But, he means, but I do know that these other people are devoid of the Spirit, and he wants us to be with the Spirit. Okay? And so this is being spiritual. And then the third one is he wants us to look forward in anticipation of our, of our reward. So let me repeat that. Work on your faith. Keep steadfast in prayer. And look forward to heaven, if I can just summarize that, okay? <laughs> so, build, and so waiting anxiously for the Lord's mercy, which is ultimately that redemption and eternal life. Now, how do we deal with these others? Fortunately, he gives us a little recipe here, not as much as we would like, but he tells uh, three things. The first one is, have mercy on some who are doubting. And we deal with people all the time where we're in a Bible study, and they're just not really convinced that the Bible really says this or that. And so we should be patient with those people. They're doubting. They have legitimate doubts about what was being said. That's how I understand this text. The second people are people who get caught up in some sin, and we just have to go over to your house and say, man, you are caught up in this thing. I'm going to have to. I love you. You're not, you may not want this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to snatch you out of the fire here, right? And the third one is having mercy on some with fear. Now, he describes what he means by fear, and this is, he's, he goes on to say, detesting the defilement of the flesh. And I think that, that, that what he's implying here is that there's a danger also with getting involved with people who are in sin. Because the danger is, just like we talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Sin actually, <coughs> it has a multiplying effect. It has an effect on those who are around us. Corinthians also tells us that we should not be deceived that bad company corrupts 
good morals. And so I remember when I first became a Christian, I wanted to bring all my other friends with me, right? But I wasn't strong enough to actually bring them, so, you know, what happened? You know, they would start having more of an effect on me, and then I was trying to have an effect on them. So really, there's three ways that we deal with sinners. Some who are honestly doubting, we're patient with them, we're trying to bring them along. Other people who are, who are we snatch them out of the fire and, and, and bring them out, and, and that's good. You know, I don't know what you do, keep, they keep going back into the fire. <laughs> but, um, and, then the, and then the third one is, we need to have this healthy respect, I think, for sin, and realizing that um, we need to have, I guess, a healthy reverence for it, and realize the dangers that it could bring. So, in closing here, in verses 24 and 25, he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. Now, there's a lot packed into that little statement. I'd like to unpack it for you, if I may. He talks about the ability to God and Christ being able to keep us from stumbling. If you notice, that is exactly what he said in, chapter, in, in verse 1, where he says that we were kept by Jesus Christ, or kept for Jesus Christ. He says it again at the end. So he's sandwiched between that, despite all this bad stuff I've said in between, you need to feel comf- confident that God is guarding you. <laughs> okay? And he is willing to keep you. He's able to make you stand blameless and joyful in his glory. And he also talks about all these things that belong to him. Now, all these different things, glory, majesty, dominion, authority, are things that the sinners, the people that have been warned about, have rejected in the text. But as Christians who want to please God, we need to give God all the glory, not take it for ourselves. We need to give God all majesty, not be looking for it. Give him dominion, not ruling ourselves. Allow him to have authority, and not taking authority and seeking after our own authority. <clears throat> and again, the last three statement here is the, is the eternal nature of God's authority, the eternal nature of God's rule and dominion. It is from before time, and he says it's now, and he says it's forever. So again, the, the, the theme of this letter is God's authority and remembering that bad things happen to those who reject God's authority because he's always been in control and he always will be in control. And so with that being uh, said, we need to ask ourselves these questions. Do we have that faith that was once delivered? Now, it doesn't. we need to make sure that we have the faith that they had, okay? And so we need to, we need to question whether or not you know, we could have been taught wrong. <laughs> so that's why it's so important for us to understand what the scriptures say, to understand that we have the same truth that they had. And that's where personal Bible study is so important because, you know, if you go to 10 different churches in town, they might all say that they have the the truth, right? But it's up to us individually to look in the Bible, determine the the church of the Bible, and then let's go around and start making sure that we are that group or that if you're looking for a congregation, making sure that you're finding the one that's, that's being talked about here. And then lastly, we need to ask ourselves this question. Is Jesus the Lord of our life? Are we his slave? Do we consider ourselves completely enslaved to his will and his desire, and are we willing to do everything that he wants us to do? I hope that most of you here have made that commitment, but I want you to reflect and be reminded of it. And if there's anything that you need to do, maybe you've been a disobedient slave and you want to make things right, you know, and need our prayers, then, you know, you could make that need known. If you have questions, if you're still doubting, then, you know, the congregation here, you know, we want to be long-suffering and merciful and help you with that, you know. If you're in the fire and you need help being snatched out, you know, that, that's what the congregation here is, is about as well. Um, but you need to be warned that sin in our lives, sin in your <coughs> life, has a bad effect. And you've got you to gotta have a healthy reverence. You know, my, my, mother, you know there's a, my mother told me this, and you've heard this as well, is that if you play with fire, you might get burned. And so we need to realize that any sin in our life is like fire, and it's going to spread more than we actually ever intend it to do. And it's going to affect more people around us than we ever intended it to uh, affect. Maybe somebody here this morning has never actually made themselves subjected to God's authority. And if you're willing to do that this morning, we want to invite you to do that as well as we stand the song, sing the song that's been selected.